wanted to talk about a few things, which I hear so much talk about, and I dislike a lot of what I hear. So, so I'm putting together this video. First of all, plenary session season four. We're rounding out season three. We're almost done with it. And soon we're going to be on season four. And I promise you, season four is going to have good things in store. We're going to be back almost exclusively oncology. I'm thinking mostly oncology at this point. I think we're going to be done with COVID-19 interviews. That's behind us. And uh, people may object, but uh, we'll be back to our usual stomping grounds, which is health policy oncology. We took a detour for COVID. We had to do it. What else could we do? We were reading and hearing so many things that I think were one point of view on the broad spectrum, one point of view. And we didn't hear other points of views or people who wanted to use a word like trade-off, pesky words like trade-off. Uh, something I saw uh, kind of made me chuckle, made me think about an article that I have coming out this week, hopefully. Um, and that article is going to be about what counts as a real COVID expert. And I think, you know, I think people forget that um, everyone thinks that it has something to do with the degrees you have. And so everyone says, you know, <clears throat> I only want to hear from an infectious disease doctor. I only want to hear from an ID epidemiologist or a virologist. But the truth is when they hear from such a person and that person says something they don't like, they no longer want to hear from them. So what do they really mean? I think we have a personal sort of scale of risk. Uh, on one extreme, it's the people who are very laissez-faire, very cavalier about COVID. They're out there uh, as if it doesn't exist. On the other extreme, it's people who literally wear the mask when driving alone in a car. And you may doubt that happens, but I assure you it happens. I've seen it on the highway here in California. Um, something in between is where I think many of us fall. Some of us have been willing to get together with people in backyard barbecues. Some of us uh, go to such things and are unwilling to lower the mask. Others of us do. Some people have been willing to meet with people privately and in indoor gatherings throughout this whole time. And I mean, wherever you fall on this range, I think so often the expert you like is the expert who has the same risk aversion or risk tolerance as you do. And, and that's really what you're saying. Um, but policy is something different than personal beliefs and what you would do for yourself. Policy is something where there is a right answer. And in this article, I talk about principles of policy that transcend any specialty. Uh, you know, you can be a pulmonologist or you can be a historian and you can get these principles and you can be an epidemiologist and, and not have any clue what I'm talking about. So it doesn't have to do with any tr specialty has to do with people who understand a few core principles. Those principles are uncertainty. Those principles are human beings love to believe that we can shape our futures in dramatic ways, but most of our interventions have effect sizes less than what you think they have. Um, and I think that will, re will relate to a couple things we'll talk about today. The first thing I have to talk about, you know, this has really been a um, <clears throat> something that's gotten my, gotten my interest and that is the emergency use authorization, the EUA. Look, um, I think it's important to recognize that the mRNA vaccines in particular have been a transcendent good. I mean, very few people expected they would be out so soon or work so dramatically well. They work so dramatically well, they change a lot of calculus, a lot of a lot of ideas, uh, for instance, about vaccine passports, because you don't really need the other person uh, to be vaccinated or not to know that you are almost 100% protected against severe disease, almost 100% protected against death. So you don't rely on their vaccination status, which I think changes the game of vaccine passports. You can read my article about that on MedPage. Um, but I wanted to talk about EUA. Uh, EUA is a type of regulatory uh, authorization is the emergency use authorization. It is not an approval. It's not a biological licensing agreement. It's not a traditional BLA. It requires shorter follow-up. It says that in situations where there is an emergency, a life-threatening and urgent need that you can make available uh, on a uh, limited time basis while that emergency lasts, a product that may not have survived traditional regulatory approval processes, may not have had enough safety or efficacy data, and I had no doubt in my mind that the preconditions for EUA were met by SARS-CoV-2 in adults. If you're an adult, COVID-19 is a unprecedented and devastating illness. The infectious fatality rate is far higher uh, than comparable viruses. It is devastating. It can overwhelm healthcare systems. It can crush infrastructure. Um, but at some age, I think we start to have to have the honest question of whether or not it is still an emergency. And there have been a number of comparisons you can read, uh, and the CDC offers their own, comparing different flu seasons like H1N1 to, um, to, to the current COVID-19 crisis um, in younger ages, particularly 12 to 15. Um, 
I think some people may say some comparisons show slightly more COVID-19 hospitalizations in those age groups. There are other ways you can slice the data and find much more comparability, but that's either way is, is, is missing the point, which is that it has to sort of be an order of magnitude difference in my mind to constitute an emergency uh, to, to, to justify the use of this lower regulatory standard. Um, and I want to walk you through a little bit of my thinking as to why that is the case. We outlined it uh, initially, Wes Pegden, Stefan Baral from Johns Hopkins, and myself um, in a British Medical Journal commentary uh, on the opinion site. Uh, there's another nice editorial about why kids uh, shouldn't get EUA, but rather traditional authorization, and perhaps only after uh, older people globally are vaccinated. I've written at least two things now, one in the Atlantic and one in MedPage today about the need to vaccinate older folks globally. They have at least a 3,000 times increased risk of death uh, from this virus, probably even more, maybe 10,000 times or 100,000 times if you factor in uh, when their healthcare system collapses in places like India, the CFR goes through the roof. Uh, when you factor in um, that we are in a much better place now than we were several months ago in this country, we have a huge chunk of American adults vaccinated and we have a plummeting case rates. And that's going to protect uh, the people in our population who have not yet been vaccinated. So you put that all together, and I think it is a no-brainer. I call it a trolley problem. It's like the classic trolley problem to send vaccines globally versus using them here, except instead of one person on the track and five people on the other track, it's like one and a hundred thousand people. So it is kind of a trolley no-brainer. Um, but I want to walk through a little bit about the EUA in this age group, because I thought it was um, it's quite interesting to me, at least. So let me share my screen here. So this is it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think when you think about the need for safety and efficacy data, why do we have this need? I guess I would say a few reasons. One, um, you want to know with some confidence that on balance, your intervention is going to benefit people. Let me start with the 55-year-olds. So, you know, I just put this together from sort of a, uh, a back of the uh, uh, EUA uh, drug label combined with uh, a couple of studies appearing in JAMA uh, to try to put this together to give you a sense of why it's a total no-brainer uh, to get an EUA emergency use authorization 55-year-old. So, you know, when these Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were approved, uh, you know, we had, um, you know, tens of thousands of people randomized um, and followed for a short period of time. That's really good at excluding safety signals below a certain frequency. Uh, it's, it's a little inadequate to exclude safety signals that occur on the order of you know maybe one in 100,000, one in 200,000, one in a million. It doesn't have quite enough power to detect those signals. And as we saw with J&J, &J, it's very likely, at least in J&J's case, that that signal is real. With the mRNA vaccines, you know, we haven't heard too much about untoward and unprecedented safety signals. Um, so this was kind of the calculus when we when we made the emergency use authorization. So there are one-time risks. When you get vaccinated, you know, the vaccine has some risks. Uh, this is what might happen to you. There are common events and rare events. Um, the common events are that, um, you know, of 100,000 55-year-olds who get vaccinated, probably about 15,000 are going to have 38-degree fevers. Uh, most of this will be short-lived. Uh, about 3,900 are going to have severe fatigue. Again, a couple of days, but it is severe fatigue, and that's not to be uh, totally ignored. I mean, that is a that is an AE. 2,500 will have severe headache, sure, and 2,100 will have severe chills. And you know, many of us have experienced this firsthand when we were vaccinated. You know, we've had some of these AEs. These are the common AEs. Those are one-time risks. Um, the benefits uh, that accrue to you are shown here on the other side of the scale. Um, there are probably a thousand people in the short run, just in a few months, uh, that will have uh, symptomatic COVID uh, without vaccination. That'll drop to uh, just about 40 people with symptomatic COVID. And to be honest, uh, this is probably not as symptomatic as these are. So these are real rip roaring symptoms. Um, there'll be 50 to 70 people dead. And oh, we know with this vaccination, um, you know, nothing is 100%, but it's as close as you can get. And, and that number is going to be dramatically lowered. Um, is it possible that there are countervailing safety signals um, on this side of the scale that we don't know about? And the answer was when emergency use authorization went through, of course, that's possible. You don't have tremendous sample sizes. But what you do know is with the sample size of the study, you can probably feel some confidence that there is no safety signal that will ever emerge that will be big enough to swamp this on the right, you know, this, the, the, the consequences of this virus in this age group are, are overwhelming. And there will be no safety signal big enough uh, to negate that, certainly for, you know, the very first few people who had it administered to them in December and January. Um, I call these one-time risks. 
Uh, although technically this 40 symptomatic COVID that is more than a one-time risk that will rise over time possibly, but very slowly, uh, I, I suspect. Um, these are risks that truly rise over time and are tied to population levels of spread. And rise can slow, of course, with um, as more people get vaccinated. So this is the calculus um, that I looked at for the EUA of 55 year old, and I thought, you know, no brainer. You want to do that. Um, when we start getting to 12 to 15 year olds, um, some more information had trickled out. Of course, we knew about the J and J safety signal. That has nothing to do with the mRNA vaccines, which are Pfizer and Moderna. Um, but we also heard uh, some reports that there have been, uh, you know, perhaps uh, a couple dozen perhaps a few more instances of myocarditis uh, that have been um, flagged by the Israeli uh, health authorities. Um, these have occurred, to my knowledge, preferentially in men of a certain age, younger ages, teenage and, uh, and young adulthood. Um, and whether or not it's vaccine related or not is unknown. Of course, myocarditis does occur with some frequency. Um, but the putative rate of this uh, post-vaccination uh, you know, we're talking about ballpark, you know, one in 80,000, one in 100,000, uh, and it is currently being investigated by the European Medicines Agency. Um, so that was what had happened in between. We went ahead, we pushed forward with the EUA in 12 to 15 year olds. And I think one of the reasons that, you know, Wes and Stefan and I had concerns was that, you know, the calculation is a little bit different. So let's talk about these, the one-time risks. I mean, it looks like kids are perhaps, perhaps a little bit more immunogenic. So if 100,000, 12 to 15 year olds are vaccinated, uh, you're gonna get 19,000, you know, 38 degree fevers, 2000 severe fatigues, uh, you know, 1900 severe headaches. Uh, so a little bit more fever, but maybe a little bit less of the other stuff. Um, in contrast, you will avert 1600 symptomatic COVIDs, but um, you know, it's not clear to me how symptomatic these COVID cases are because these aren't adults, these are kids. And these kids are participating in sort of a, a randomized trial where there is to some degree um, a surveillance of the endpoint. By that, I mean, they contact them, see if they have any symptoms like anosmia, uh, and then will test proactively. It's a little bit different than the natural order of things where some people will get tested if they believe the symptoms are, are bothersome enough to justify the testing. Here, they're kind of seeking those out. Uh, we see this kind of design in studies of um, anticoagulants and, and blood clots, and we have these sort of surveilled blood clots, and we debate that. We debate the significance of those indefinitely, but, but this is roughly the calculation. Um, these risks will also rise over time on the right, uh, but they are tied to population levels, and those levels are, are plummeting right now. They're, they're cavitating because of adult vaccination. Um, the risk of death without vaccine in this age group is, is rather low, and you can't use, I think some people on the internet were using you know, they were using analyses that aren't really applicable to the United States. Now, we're talking about the U.S. here. This is a U.S. regulatory decision. So frankly, um, you know, we have to focus on the U.S. Uh, situation. And our situation has to use the rate of death in this age group in kids here now who may get infected, um, uh, combining the rate of, of infection in the population with the rate of bad outcomes. And I conservatively estimate that this is from a JAMA paper where, if anything, this is sort of an upper bound estimate that it's about uh, one in a million or, or, or 0.1 to 0 0.3 in 100,000, which is, you know, actually uh, one in 333,000, uh, quite, quite, quite high, I think, actually, uh, if one is combining the probability of getting infected with the probability of some bad outcome like death. Uh, and there are, of course, going to be some cases of MISC that are uh, very likely uh, induced by the virus. So this is what you're getting here on this side. <clears throat> what about on this side? On this side, you have, I put pending EMA inquiry. Um, so the reason I had a pause here um, that I felt like the BLA is probably the preferred regulatory option is that it would have bought us about four more months during which time we would have had uh, uh, these investigations complete. Um, and I guess what I want to say here is, to me, it, it you know reasonable people can, of course, disagree, and somebody can say that on balance, this is probably going to tip in favor of vaccination. But I think there is more cause for um, a question. Uh, it, it's not a slam dunk, obviously, as a 55. And if you put them side by side, I mean, it's 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 a no brainer. 50 to 70 dead. Here we're talking about 0.1 to 0.3. You know, here we're talking about rare events because we have a sample size of 40,000. We've got just you know a couple thousand kids randomized here. Um, you know, we don't have the power. For rare events. Now, somebody will say, like, look, um, you can extrapolate um, the adult experience to the kids. I think you can extrapolate the near adult experience, so 16, 17. I didn't see a whole lot of that. And I also do know uh, that people are looking into uh, myocarditis right now. And so, you know, it, it doesn't mean that it won't be the right decision in retrospect, the EUA in 12 to 15. But I would have argued uh, that it should not have been the preferred regulatory path. And now we're getting to the, the final question, which is as we move into children, are we gonna use a BLA or an EUA? 
I think the answer in my mind is clear this calculation as you get to about five, uh, 10. Um, you know, it's even more um, that SARS-CoV-2 is not a emergency in that age group. Uh, they're going to be even more shielded by the fact that everyone 12 and up has got an EUA. Um, the rates are, are going to be plummeting. The vaccination status in adults is, is going to go trickle up even higher yet. Um, so, you know, what do the kids stand to gain and what is yet uncertain? Um, if those two things are roughly the same weight in your hands, I think e e EUA cannot proceed. It has to be BLA. I think whether or not it is an emergency in that age group uh, must be doubted. Um, I must admit that, uh, you know, my point of view is, is I think, quite comparable um, to Cody Meissner, who's on the FDA vaccine committee, and he had a great interview on NPR on point. Uh, where he articulated some of these concerns, um, said many times that he's not 100% confident it's going to have a favorable risk-benefit profile, and we really want to have that certainty. Um, one of the points he makes rather eloquently is that uh, what's at stake is not just this disease. It is literally uh, confidence in vaccination programs and vaccination regulation. Um, you want to have that confidence that regulators are always erring on the side of uh, really knowing the risk benefit calculus tips in favor. And you don't want uh, people uh, cutting it too close for the simple reason that there may be an unprecedented safety signal. It may emerge at a certain age group uh, that you don't yet see. And if that does occur, you may have an existential crisis on your hands. We're in such a divided place, um, such a, a torn place um, that people may not be able to, to really process that. And I, I do worry about sort of that existential threat. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, last thing I wanted to talk about was um, the CDC's mask guidance. You know, um, <clears throat> I'll share you one more slide because it cracks me up. Cracks me up what they're what these people are up to. Okay, how it started, how it's going, how it started. You know, in January, I wrote my op-ed in MedPage today where I said, "Look, um, you know, is it okay to relax restrictions? Is it okay to throw away the mask after vaccination?" I say, "Yes, of course." Why did I say that? I mean, you know, we already at that time had a host of information which you can read in the commentary that suggested uh, that it's going to be rather safe. But more to the point, um, we didn't have any evidence, and I don't think we do uh, that after a group of people is administered a vaccine with a 95% relative risk reduction, that there is a, on a respiratory virus, that there is a continued benefit of, of masking. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, this was labeled by someone on Twitter, uh, somebody who themselves has a very uh, uh, skewed point of view and distorted point of view. Um, they write, this is dangerous misinformation, extremely negligent, of course, hot rhetoric for someone who's eating crow right now, because of course the CDC says, you know, it's totally fine to go vaccinated uh, people to throw away the mask. Uh, indoors, outdoors, um, you know, you can have get togethers. They said that a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, of course that's the case. Um, saying otherwise, I think was a distortion of science. Um, so what do I wanna say about this new guidance? Um, you know, people are really scared um, and their um, concern has, um, has, uh, has reached Twitter. Um, you know, Twitter probably should have gotten an EUA to treat COVID-induced anxiety because that's appears what it's, it's primarily used for these days. Um, and, and, and what are their concerns? Their concerns are, of course, um, stories about, you know, what if scenarios. Um, I think that's not the way to think about policies. You know, the way to think about policies is to say, um, is it plausible that continued enforcement of this policy is going to have some aggregate benefit? Um, and it's difficult. It's very difficult to believe that is the case. So one of the things you have to that goes into that calculation is um, one, you have to you have to have some sense of what do you think the effect size of of community mask use is, and how is that related to the baseline case rate? So what does the effect size? What happens to the effect size as as the rate with which people are carrying the virus is is plummeting? What happens to the effect size of the intervention? We actually never measured the the effect size of the intervention. We were rather indifferent to it. We just assumed it was really good. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, it's probably not 95% because that's what we see from the vaccine. It is way, way short of that. Um, then there's the second level, which isn't just the intervention. It's not wearing the mask. Intervention is the mandate to wear the mask. A lot of people are going to do it anyway. There's going to be this inertia we saw from this Texas data that just came out from Ember that after the governor rescinded the mask mandate, you see actually very little difference in mobility um, uh, after the government restricted uh, or removed the restrictions on business businesses. And you actually see no increase in COVID-19. Um, you also see no increase in economic productivity. It appeared that the mandate was little more than... Um, 
uh, you know, a gesture. It was just a government uh, re imposition uh, that actually didn't affect behavior. And I guess whether you're a conservative or a progressive like myself, um, if somebody imposes a restriction and it doesn't actually impact behavior at all and it doesn't change any outcomes, I think we should agree that those sorts of government restrictions are not useful. They don't do anything. And apparently this is what this Enver paper, I think makes a compelling case um, for the Texas mask mandate. So back to this, what do I think is gonna happen? Um, <clears throat> I think it's much hand wringing over nothing. I suspect we're going to continue to be on our trajectory of falling cases. Um, I suspect that people who uh, are really concerned that this is a problem, um, they probably should have been advocating some point in this entire uh, pandemic that we generate some data under what conditions do mask mandates have benefits? What base rates do you need for them to have benefits? What's the magnitude of the benefit when the benefit exists? Um, is the benefit taken away by effect modifiers that you may not appreciate? Uh, does it diminish over time as a population may get um, uh, tired or fatigued uh, with the intervention? And uh, we've done very little of that. And that I think is a, is a failure of science. So those are my rough thoughts on these issues. I mean, I think um, the EUA is tricky. Um, I think if it goes any younger, you gotta do BLA. I mean, it's not that I don't think it will be safe. I actually, if I were to bet, I bet it will be uh, a net benefit. Uh, but what I do think is the challenge is that you don't have an emergency to justify that. And there are ongoing, I think, initiatives to better suss out the safety. And we want those to uh, complete. And we also wanna see where we are in this country. And we can't call things emergencies um, if they are not strictly emergencies. And, and if the rates of this are roughly uh, even you know, one to twofold higher, uh, but no more than twofold higher than, than seasonal influenza, uh, or if it's even closer by some, by some analyses that Wes and has put together, uh, you, know, you really can't justify that. I mean, it has to be sizably different, um, I think, to, to subvert traditional regulatory mechanisms. These mechanisms exist for a reason. If the, reg if the mechanisms serve no purpose, um, then your case should be to amend the BLA. Uh, amend the rules for vaccine BLA, but they do exist to ensure uh, risk benefit profiles are favorable. I think if anything, I would like to see the sample size of these kids studies to be a lot larger because the issue isn't efficacy. I think we will concede they are very likely to be efficacious. Um, the issue isn't common AEs, the issue is the rare AEs. I think the J&J &J story is illustrative. Um, the J&J &J story is a good, I mean, J&J &J is a good vaccine. It still has a role. It has a huge role globally. If you were in India, in a place with explosive cases, I'd give J&J &J to every single person uh, who wants it, who I could find. Um, but J&J &J has uh, almost uh, no role, I think, in women less than 50 in our country, in the setting of alternatives, um, with a CVT rate that's probably between, you know, one in 80,000 for some ages to maybe about one in 200,000, because that harm may even offset, uh, you know, whatever the Delta benefit is. And the Delta here is J&J &J now minus mRNA later. That's the Delta. Uh, and this harm may exceed that Delta. I, everywhere I crunch the numbers, I get that. So um, those are my thoughts there. And then the last thought about policy and what I think is the real crux of the issue. Um, there are so many people on Twitter who uh, want to comment on policy and, and sort of move into the space of science communication. They say, you know, I'm not a science, I don't do science, but I want to be a science communicator. Um, you know, I think when you start talking about these kinds of policies, uh, if you are not prepared uh, to do a lot of work uh, to understand the issues, to understand drug regulation, to think about probability, low uh, instance probability, uh, you probably shouldn't be weighing in. And I just don't see uh, the appeal to weigh in. Uh, I, I get interested in these because I think there are rash there's a rationality failure. I'm shocked that uh, more people don't see, I think, the, the core challenges I see um, to use of this unprecedented uh, pathway for these ages where it is substantively different. Um, you know, uh, rhetoric without numbers, uh, qualitative impressions of risk are, are rather useless. Uh, it's a total failure. It's an intellectual failure as an exercise. Um, if you want to talk about the value of mask mandates and lifting them and the CDC's decision, um, postulate. What do you think what do you think the delta is going to be on that? Do some back of the envelope calculations. Use the current base rates and use where you think base rates will be. What do you think the excess uh, infection rate will be? Uh, you want to tell stories about what might happen if. Uh, that's fine uh, for narrative medicine class. Uh, that's not fine for actual health policy. Okay, you need to understand. 
understand the difference. Uh, a little story about what would happen if once this child goes in and there's somebody there who was lying and coughed, what would happen there? That's not policy, okay? That's called uh, that's called fairy tale medicine. I don't know what that is, but I think people are reasoning in that way. Um, you need to ask what happens to aggregate in in aggregate instances when huge sweeping policies are are made, and there are some core principles. So I hope people read my commentary where I outline those core principles. Um, it isn't. I can imagine a story that scares me. No, sir, uh, because you cannot wrap your head around countervailing effects and impacts that you may not even dream. Um, and, and, and that's why it's good to have some numerical sense and see what kind of wiggle room you have uh, in these interventions. Um, and, and that's the, the thing, you know, EUA and a 55 year old, how much wiggle room, you know, there's, uh, there's 40, you know, you can find a one in, uh, in 50,000 catastrophic rare event. Uh, you won't budge that calculation. Uh, you find that in a 12 year old and you're going to end up with a rescinding of the EUA. Um, the J and J, the story is different because there are alternatives, right? Um, and so that we even one in 200K in, in that age group, I think is an unacceptable risk when the alternative is just right there. Uh, so this is the way to start thinking about things numerically. Okay. On that positive note, we're going to be back season four plenary session. It's coming. We're thinking about it more and more. There's going to be no more COVID interviews. I've had it I'm done with it. It's going to be oncology interviews. And we're going to get back to the monologues, which is what people have said they missed. I don't know who, uh, but a few people said they missed it. So on that positive note, thanks for, thanks for listening.